Hi, everyone. Um, you know, when I was first asked to speak here at uh, TEDx Oakville, and I, I had a chance to, to look at the theme, the question, uh, I thought, well, you know, that, that'll be easy. I'll just say, you know, I'm a good academic. I'll just do some research, and I'll develop a, a special talk here for the people. And uh, so I, uh, I did my research, and, uh, uh, well, I, go I Googled it. <laughs> what happened is I Googled it. And, uh, well, I, it really wasn't much help. And so I tried uh, Wikipedia and Yahoo and Bing, and uh, really didn't come up with much. <laughs> um, Although I did get a 10% uh, off coupon at a decent Japanese restaurant on the lakeshore. But, uh, and actually, when I Googled it this morning, um, there were lots of links all to this conference. So that wasn't really helpful. And uh, so I figured, well, you know, I'm on my own here. I've got to take a different approach. I'll do, I have a background in scientific visualization as well. And so I thought I'd do an, an analysis. Maybe I'd do some visualization. And so, you know, I did a pie chart to compare the values of an individual in Oakville and, and the rest of the world, changing the world. And, and well, you know, you can hardly see it there. It, it really wasn't much help either, I'm afraid. You know, I did bar graphs and scatter charts and tried to do some analysis. And uh, so I, I was beginning to lose hope. I'm going, what am I going to talk about here? Until, until an idea popped into my head. Oh. Sorry, that's an old slide. Hold on a sec. Oh, wait, uh, that's better. Okay, until, until an idea popped into my head. Uh, and, I, and I remember to remind myself of the butterfly effect. Now, for, for those of you who don't know, the butterfly effect is a popular metaphor uh, from chaos theory and explains the sensitivity to initial conditions. Uh, basically, uh, small variations at the start, at the initial conditions, can have dramatic effects on the, uh, the ultimate uh, result in a dynamical system. So the metaphor is a butterfly flapping its wings on one side. One side of the Earth can cause a hurricane on the other side of the Earth. So here we're starting to get a germ of an idea of how somebody in Oakville can make real change and, and affect the rest of the world. And, uh, so you've probably heard of the butterfly effect uh, you know, in the movies, particularly movies about time travel, where somebody travels back into time and you know, steps on a bug or leaves a gum wrapper behind. And then when they get back to their own time, everything has changed. So if you think of the Back to the Future uh, movie series, uh, where Biff gets hold of a 2015 sports almanac, and he becomes rich and corrupts the town. And then when McFly goes back uh, to 1985, Everything has changed. The town is degenerated, and it's truly awful. So that's, that's the butterfly effect that you're seeing there. So great. I'm done. I proved it. Here's how someone in Oakville, someone in Oakville yawns. And you know, over in Australia, a wind turbine generates 10,000 kilowatts of green electricity. Uh, OK, well. But there are a couple of problems here. Um, first off, I, you're probably not really impressed by this as a talk. And, and secondly, I've only talked for three minutes, and uh, I'm supposed to talk for eight minutes. So if you'll allow me, I'll talk about something I know more about. Um, as you know, I'm a prof here at Sheridan. And uh, most of my time and effort these days is spent uh, teaching and writing curriculum and researching, and all to do with uh, video games. OK, and the video games are really the perfect TED topic because they involve technology, entertainment, and design. But I'm not going to start off by talking about the games themselves, really. I, I want to talk about the people who play the games, the gamers. Okay. And so who's a gamer? Well, the, the standard definition of a gamer is someone who frequently plays games on some sort of electronic medium. You know, a computer or a game console. Uh, could be on the internet or, or really on a handheld device, uh, a Game Boy or, or even your cell phone. And you know, there's a, a stereotype of the gamer who's a 15-year-old you know, sitting in the dark in their parents' basement, hunched over a game console, killing aliens. And, well, it, that's just what it is. It's a stereotype, and it's not, not true. The Entertainment Software Association uh, has done a series of surveys over the years. And that's in 1990, the average age 
of a gamer was 30 years old. In 2000 and, uh, 2007, the average age of a gamer was 33 years old. And in 2009, the average age of a gamer is 35 years old. The gamers are getting older. <laughs> you saw the trend, that's great. <laughs> So here's a squash pie chart that shows uh, the distribution of game, gamers by age. And you can see 50%, full 50% are in the age range 19 to 49. And what's astonishing here is there are the same percentage of gamers over the age of 50 as there are under the age of 18. Gamers are old. Okay, now here at Sheridan, we have a research center, the Sheridan Elder Research Center, CERC for short, and it's led by uh, Professor Pat Spadafora. And what, uh, what CERC, uh, the goal of CERC is, and I'm gonna read this, is to identify, develop, test, and support the implementation of innovative strategies that improve the quality of life for older adults and their families through applied research. And CERC has done over the years a number of wonderful, really wonderful projects um, multidisciplinary projects involving technology and the arts, and here you can see uh, here's some uh, seniors engaged in a dance therapy. And Pat and I have been friends and colleagues for many years, and we've often talked about, well, can we do a project together? What would that look like? Uh, can we can we merge our, our distinct uh, disciplines and and uh, do a research project under the banner of CERC? And so what we came up with is. Uh, is how can video games be used to improve the quality of life for older adults? So, here's our research subjects. I'll call them Mr. and Mrs. X. Well, I, actually, I call them Cal and Mary. They're my, they're my in-laws. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm, I love and really admire them. I hope I don't embarrass them by talking about them. But Cal and Mary are in their mid-80s. And they live in their own home in Oakville, which they've lived in for almost 60 years. They both drive cars. They're active, uh, uh, vital people, citizens. And they're gamers. Now, they're not gamers by the ESA's definition, but they're gamers nonetheless. They play bridge every week. Up until recently, they curled all the time. Uh, they golf. They still golf. Um, they do the daily jumble puzzle in the star, and uh, they're really sud Sudoku enthusiasts. And wherever to get, whenever we're together as a family at the cottage, they're always, uh, <clears throat> you know, urging people to play games, you know, card games or um, Clue. And well, Cal's really a killer at Yahtzee. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet against him. So they, they love to play games. And if you ask them, they would say they would tell you that playing games has helped contribute to their cognitive health, to being sharp and, and aware. And, and I'd have to agree with them. But you know, I'm not going to pretend that playing games is the whole of it, and, and not even the play aspect of the games. It's the sociable aspect of the gameplay that's helped them stay uh, mentally fit. And so here's, here's another aspect of the stereotype that's shattered. Games are a sociable activity. People like to play games with other people. Now, I know my 13-year-old, he and his friends, there's nothing they love to do more than to get, to get all together in a room and play video games. Sometimes they'll take turns on the console, or some of them will play on, on the laptop while others are playing on the console. He even has one friend who will load his Xbox and a small TV into his backpack and bicycle over so they can have a couple of consoles going at the same time. So games are a sociable activity as well. Um, but, you know, getting Cal and Mary to play video games that have some kind of therapeutic goal and then measuring the result by, <clears throat> you know, scanning their brains in an MRI machine, I really don't think that's going to contribute to the, their quality of life because they're really not video gamers. So, remember the butterfly effect. You have to remember the butterfly effect because it's going to be on the exam later. I have... I had to make a slight shift in my perception here. I couldn't use them as a research, a research group, a research study. I had to make a slight shift one rung down the age ladder to a different group. And so here's the research group I came up with. 
Okay. So it's not the cheerful young guy in the foreground, a family friend. Uh, it's, it's that rather dour, doleful looking guy at the far end of the couch. And uh, also known as Baby Boomer. For me. So. Um, so the Baby Boomer generation is a demographic bulge of people who were born after the Second World War between 1946 and 1964, and they're getting older. They're, um, the oldest of them is reaching retirement age, they're getting to be 65 now, and uh, let me find where I am, okay. And there are a lot of them actually, there are 77 million Americans in this, in this group. And uh, if you remember our pie chart from before, a lot of them are gamers as well. They fall into those demographic, into those uh, groups where people play games. And a recent uh, study done by Deloitte found that 31% of, of baby boomers had played a newly released video game in the last six months. So perfect, they're perfect for our study. Not only are they old, getting older, but they also play video games. Now, I was born in 1954, uh, right, right there in the middle of the baby boomer curve. Uh, and I, you know, I've been playing video games for well, a little over 25 years. I mean, I've been doing other things as well as playing video games, but I've been playing video games for about 25 years. And you know, I've changed, I've changed over those 25 years. Believe it or not, I used to have hair. I didn't always wear glasses. You know, my reflexes were quicker, and, and so was my memory. But I still enjoy playing video games, but I really can't play those games I used to enjoy. You know, my reflexes aren't quick enough. You know, I don't see quite as well. But I'd really love to be able to play those games. That would contribute to, to my uh, joy in life. So as we grow older, our potential for disability increases. And a recent US census, and this isn't a plug for the mandatory long form census, but take these with. About 20% of Americans reported some kind of disability. And this disability is defined as uh, having problems with vision or hearing or mobility or some kind of cognitive or emotional impairment. But you can see the distribution is not even throughout the age range. You can see that in the range 65 plus has almost twice the average rate, 40, over 40% in terms of disability. 70% of strokes occur in people over the age of 65. 60% of people over the age of 65 report uh, arthritis or some kind of joint systems. And arthritis is actually the largest single cause of disability in the population. And, and arthritis, the number of arthritis sufferers is expected to double by the year 2030 to about 40 million people. So, you know, getting old isn't great, it has its downside, but it doesn't have to be quite so bad. And one small way we can improve the quality of life is changing how video games are designed and developed. So game flow. Flow is an essential property of, of games, of the fun aspect of games. And flow is an idea from, uh, uh, developed from uh, positive psychology. It's about 20 years old, but it's an adop been adopted by a, a number of uh, different areas, different disciplines, sports, teaching and learning, and game design. And basically the idea is that uh, challenge the challenge of the activity should not exceed the ability of the person performing the activity. Because if challenge is greater than ability, anxiety and frustration result. And if the challenge is below the level of ability, then boredom results. And you know that way if you're uh, reading books and you read a book that's got you know, too many long words and difficult concepts, you get frustrated with it. Or if you read something that's too trivial and too simple, you get bored. And the same is true of games. So the goal of game design to maintain that flow where you're focused, you're immersed in the activity, 
you know, where you sit down and then you stand up two hours later, you know, time has passed in an instant. That's the goal of game flow. And when you have some kind of disability, you know, you're an older gamer and you don't move as quickly, you can't accomplish those tasks quite as quickly. You can't, you know, you can't make Mario jump as fast as he needs to jump to get those stars. And so that results in frustration and interrupts game flow. And many, game, many mainstream games, as you know, are, are really not accessible to older gamers. Many games lack the type of accommodations that are necessary. So there's some very simple accommodations that game designers can make to be more inclusive and more accessible. Things like uh, larger texts, different fonts, you know, color changes for colorblind gamers, um, voiceovers for people who can't read the text at all, uh, relocatable controls for people who might have mobility issues, say with one limb or another, variable speed settings, et cetera, et cetera. And the game designer, Jenova Chen, who's, who's uh, really an expert in game flow, has identified that games should have um, a lot of different variations, a lot of different variations in, and they, they can, should be set up at the beginning of the game, and they should be bundled together, you know, the ways you can pick. So this is one way of overcoming it, but ultimately this way isn't really that satisfying. And here's what, here's the interface that we propose. I know it looks like a plot for a Seinfeld episode, but, but really, uh, what I'm proposing here is, is a, a transparent, invisible, auto, um, automatic and dynamic interface which senses the player's ability, which adjusts itself to their capabilities uh, automatically without thought or intervention on the part of the gamer. And that's a lofty goal, but that's our research goal. And so by now you're asking, well, well, okay, we remember the butterfly effect and you showed us that butterfly moment where you shifted. So where's the hurricane? Show me the hurricane. So that's the hurricane, 32.5 million people who could be positively affected by more accessible video games. And that's right now, and that's just in the US. If we spread our hurricane, if it reaches a force seven and it goes around the world, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people. So that's our hurricane. So finally, what I'd like to say to you is, in your own lives, Try and capture those butterfly moments, those times when you can make a slight shift in the initial conditions. Be like butterflies and make hurricanes. Thank you very much.